Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. My name is Jens. I will do the talk with my colleague Peer. He will uh, take over in a couple of minutes with all the fancy stuff. I will. Um, yeah, my, my name is Jens Nie. I'm, my background is experimental physics, so not a native computer science guy. Uh, job title currently is Truth It's Difficult, Best Matches Technology Scout, so I'm not a main uh, software developer. Peer is. He will take over in a couple of minutes to show that. We're talking about um, we, our way to, to, to Python at Rosen. Um, I will start off a bit with what Rosen is. Um, we are a, a pipeline inspection company, actually. So we build devices uh, to help getting the environment safe. And a lot of industries um, most successfully in, in pipeline inspection. The company was founded by Hermann Rosen over 35 years ago. It's quite successful, privately owned, which is good for us. And we are a technology leader in pipeline inspection, which makes us very proud. We're doing some good money, and Hermann is someone who is doing, doing a lot of investment back in R&D, which also is good for us. Um, this is what, is what might happen to the pipelines out there in the world, uh, something that we really don't like to see. And we were doing a lot of work to prevent this. It's the idea if that, some, if that happened to some of the oil and gas guys, you might better have called us before. Um, this is what we are placing against this. Um, this is the, the selection of, of images of these so-called pigs, the pipeline inspection gouges. The short version, we're doing pigs in pipes. It's, it's pigging, it's cold, what we're doing when we're doing the pipeline inspection. And we have these devices traveling through the pipeline with the oil or gas that is transported. Um, we have them from 3 inches to 56 inches. 3 inches is more the size of a coffee mug. 56 inches you might be able to walk through it. Um, these pipelines are a few hundred kilometers. The special ones very short. The longer ones up to a thousand or even more kilometers. And we can do inspections of these in one go. And we're building these devices for ourselves, we're not selling them. And it's all self-made, but screws, um, electronics, everything is only developed, only built, and we maintain these devices as well. Um, as I said, we are, we are very good in R&D. More than 15% of all Rosen employees work in R&D, which is a lot, considering that we have more than 1,400 people in our main location in Ling, where the research backbone is. And we also have offices here nearby in Stutensee. And we are available worldwide. Um, within R&D, we have main competency, so to speak, in, in R&D that is based on mathematics, physics, um, computer science, of course, um, electronics, robotics, and chemistry and mechanics, as we're doing most of the work that we do ourselves. And some of them are very much influenced and benefiting of Python for quite some time. And there is these areas of computer science, mathematics, and physics. And looking to the history of Python at Rosen, this is a chart that is quite popular these days, showing that Python is a very attractive language and its interest in it grows rapidly. And that chart, based on Stack Overflow, starts in 2012. And to see where Rosen began with that, with, with Python, I've extended that line to the back in time. And it started in, in 2002 already with some small tools helping us to do simple work. Um, it's not main topics that we used for it. It was more um, small little tools to make FEM calculations more automatically, more repeatedly, uh, do the internal reports based on the results, make the distribution, um, fitting data, so to speak, was one of the main things. Um, what we're doing is also based on, on, on big data. So we consider ourselves to be big data natives. Um, we did large volumes of data sets, even before big data was called big data. We always faced large volumes of data. Um, as our tools are producing a lot of data when they do the measurements, we are collecting data of each and every square millimeter of that pipeline. If you imagine a larger pipeline in diameter, a thousand kilometer long having data at each and every millimeter that gives you large data sets these days. So we are 
quite used to handling more than a terabyte of raw data coming from a tool in a single pipeline inspection run. And we are doing a lot of pipeline inspections over the year. So this is what IBM faced to be important for, yeah, for big data. That's what they described it for. Um, volume and velocity is obvious, I think. Um, variety is the modern interpretation of big data. It's about the complexity in it, connecting several data sources, making the view complete, but even com more complex to handle. And veracity is also something, it's, in, it's all about the trust that you have in the data, which is all, also a very challenging thing. To the right is the usual suspects if you are doing big data these days. Most larger companies based on these tools. Um, this is the view that we have of big data at Rosen. We're doing it completely based on Python and Linux. Um, we are in a conservative industry. The oil and gas industry is very conservative in, in tools. And so we are not allowed to use cloud services. But we are preparing for this. As you can see, we are running a data center in Lingen based on Mesos. We use Docker. And within the Docker containers, we're having all these fancy Python stuff. and doing really, really good work with that. But it's not always only the big data thing. It's also, and that is what the success story started with, and we're doing all the laboratory experiments for creating new sensors and enhancing their properties using Python. Every single experiment in our lab is done in Python control. That was one of the first things when we mainly started running Python at Rosen in 2007 where we replaced MATLAB with it, um, which was the usual tool that most people in the industry were using that day. Um, and that was because it was no longer flexible enough. It seems to have a quite complete tool set, MATLAB, but we faced that we were into creating a lot of graphical user interfaces for our end users to use what we prototyped in MATLAB before. And for those of you who did write graphic user interfaces in MATLAB, that is a major pain in the ass. It's something that you don't like to do. And we've, we face that there might be better options in using Python and Qt, for example, is an excellent wrapper for that. And we're very quick with that. And we accelerated our prototyping development a lot with these things. So that was quite a success story. And today, People are no longer using simple scripts in the laboratory. They all write their small graphic user interfaces to drive the experiments, which is quite neat. We did a lot of prototyping with these things as well, and you can see the images. Um, that's what we are mostly up to um, doing. For example, the magnetic flux leak, which um, sensorics and the measurements, which uh, my colleague Hendrik described brilliantly yesterday in his talk. And this were some first visualizations a couple of years ago where we tried to make it more 3D-like and it was very, very easy to do that with Python. And to the right is another thing which is quite current. It's uh, based on um, displaying raw navigation data from our tools so they track where they are in the pipeline and you can plot these values on a map and this is a rather short line with 10 kilometers but it has 13 and a half million data points collected. That is the real raw data. And I can display it in a, in a Jupyter notebook with a single Python thread using data shader, which is one of the very, very common tools. It's really, really nice because I can handle this data interactively. 13 and a half million data points with a meaning behind it on a map interactively in a browser window, which is quite impressive, I think. Um, this is where all the magic happens. Um, our own data center, not that large, but quite efficient. And to the right is our storage system that's based on Isilon storage, which is state-of-the-art scaled storage system. Um, Apple uses this as well. If you are an iTunes user, then the data is always coming from such a system. And this is the same system that we use it well. We run a four petabyte cluster uh, currently in Lingen. And it's also all about data science. And that is a bit sad story. In our industry, it started more than 20 years ago when people thought about using neural networks to automate their work. And work is finding anomalies in a pipeline in the raw data, making classification, sizing, and getting an idea of the impact to the pipeline. And for those of you who remember Zofia's lightning talk yesterday, which was quite excellent, 
um, that might be the same thing at that day. Um, people really suffered from, um, suffered from overfitting. So there was no way to make it really complete and happening. And this is, till this day, a problem in the industry. Because they said they really invested a lot of money and they simply told everyone it won't work. But um, we need to have a lot of information on this. We are really into machine learning, as you heard yesterday. And we are quite confident and we have the trust in this technology. We want to have it running. It is the only way for the future. So we're really looking for samples like that. This is um, real-world photos of what you can find in a pipeline. We need a lot of data representing these things. We're doing all these things in the laboratory, and we are, we are completing our, our stack of plates and anomalies so that we can use all the, the sensor setups that we have, make the measurements, and increase the number of, of data sets that we have. And we found quite clever ways to circumvent the problems that we're facing with getting dig up in verification results, which are really, really expensive. You can't simply spend a few dollars or something to get new data sets. We're thinking in millions of dollars to be spent to get one data set. So we had, for example, finite element calculations to complete the view, and that is difficult to merge. Um, my colleague Henry spoke about this yesterday, about the challenges behind this one. And we're also running a, a test field uh, where, we can have, where we have these joints available, a lot of them, more than six kilometers of pipe. And there we are testing our tools. We are pulling them through the pipeline to get an idea of what they are really doing. And to the bottom is one of the, our pull winches, the new ones. And with that one, we can pull our largest tool, 56 inches, four tons of weight with seven meters a second through this pipeline, which is quite important for us to be able to do that. But in the end, and this is the most important thing, we do not believe in black boxes. We know that it's possible to make machine learning create these black boxes, but we have a lot of human experience at, at our site, and this is the most important thing. So we're more interested in these reinforcement learning techniques that our experts can feed their knowledge into it and make the algorithms better. And we take Python very, very seriously. We just finished a one-week course with a trainer from Anaconda helping us to bring us to the next level, so to speak. We had addressed more than 60 developers in Lingen, and more than 30 managers enjoyed a really nice keynote. And we had a really long waiting list, so there's more to come. We have a lot of people in the queue, all learning Python at Rosen. And with that, I would like to hand over to Per for all the fancy stuff behind it. Thank you. So, hi again. Um, I will talk about our development process. What was our historical development and what is our current and future development? We had a classical setup where we've seen software engineering and math and statistics as distinct fields of expertise. We had software developers doing the one and physicists and algorithm developers doing the other. They were just connected by their business knowledge, their common business, business knowledge. So our end users were sat uh, next to the software developers. They were doing our products. They were developing our products. Um, the end users had a point of exchange with the software developers. As Jens said, um, our first um, exchange between the different domains was writing Word documents, describing a model and our software developers re-implemented it using some toolchain, and then we started using MATLAB. But MATLAB was only used to give it to our software developers for re-implementation. Nonetheless, our end users got aware of these prototypes we developed, and they, they um, switched to more to the physics and algorithm developer side, and use these prototypes like products. But these prototypes were no products. We had no trained physicists for the point of exchange with our end users, and we had a lot of misunderstandings. The end user thought he would use a product 
but this was no product. It's, it's, um, it has to be said, this is no product, it's a prototype. So to overcome these issues of um, what Jens said of uh, MATLAB prototypes and GUI programming and so on, we faced um, how will we proceed with our prototypes and we had a few alternatives um, which were Octave and Scilab but also Python. Now Python is clearly seen to be of the software engineering domain. It's no longer, like MATLAB, seen to the math and statistics domain. Every physicist know MATLAB, but not every software developer knows MATLAB. Now every software developer knows Python, but the algorithm developers and um, physicists are not in the, in the state of knowing Python. Um, So Python was the glue for us. It's not the glue language for us, it was the glue for our domains of expertise. We faced that software engineering and math and statistics were never that far apart, but they were somehow now combined. And this is the classical setup for a data scientist. We now have some kind of data engineer, a data analyst, or a software developer, and they are using the tools we always used, like NumPy, Scikit-Learn, Pandas, and Matplotlib. And now our software developers began to use C Python or Cython, so they used the bare metal Python. <clears throat> this also changed the way we think about our prototypes. We are now no longer talking about prototypes, we are more talking about MVPs, minimum viable products. Those are sellable products in an early development stage which only contain the necessary features for our customers' demands. But these MVPs are also linked to an iterative process. We are testing early, we are deploying often, we analyze the feedback and we integrate it. Nonetheless, we were we had a bound um, to our past mindset. This was only done in our math or is only done in our math and statistics domain. It's not doing the round trip to, through our software engineering domain. So how do we get our Python MVPs to product? Well, we re-implement it. So this is not what we really want. What we really want from within ourselves and what our customer demands for is a faster time to market. They want new functionality and they want it fast. So how do we get to this state? We initiated a process where we're talking about introducing an extension API to all our product, products, extending them with Python MVPs, like a plugin system. So this will hopefully draw the attention of our end users back to the products, but the products now are a combined experience for all users. It's combined software engineering, math and statistics, and you no longer can distinguish between a product and an MVP, but you have the faster time to market. So now that I talked about our development process, I would like to say a few words about our infrastructure. As Jens introduced our PICs, they collect data from a few gigabytes to, up to a few terabytes, and they are the data is stored on our storage system, which has around four petabytes of uh, storage. The storage, or the data, is actively used by around 25 data scientists. They are backed by five and a few more software developers. Five software developers doing MVPs, but more than 100 software developers for business products and so on. These data scientists, and I now say software developers are also data scientists, are divided into five specialized teams working on MVPs. We do have one team for developing and maintaining a data warehouse, so organizing our data sets. And there's one team supporting all the others and maintaining our infrastructure. Infrastructure means 
where do we put our code and um, what do we write, how do we write it. We are writing uh, around 1.5 million lines of Python code and we are doing this backed up by Anaconda, an Anaconda distribution. Using all that's given by Anaconda is also the Conda package manager, so we are packing our MVPs using Conda and distributing it to our users no matter where or no matter what system they are on. To have the complete overview, we have a circle in there. We can use our own MVPs, our own development for as input for our data scientists again, or we can give a final package to some end users. So we are at the point where we thought about what comes next or how to describe what we are doing or what we've done. And Jens and I thought about it like the sand of a hidden champion. If no solution exists, create one and share it. Or think radical, but based on available tradition. Respect available skills, they can support you. Do not reinvent the wheel. Use existing solutions as often as you can. If it's not maintained, consider maintaining it. If it's not successful from the beginning, be patient. Success does not come overnight, it's hard work. Others have worked hard as well. Respect their contributions. Do not consider Python to be the solution for everything. But enjoy that it's available almost everywhere. Be open. Encourage discussion. Get people involved. And embrace diversity, you need it. And we need you. <coughs> We do have open jobs, for sure, and we need good data scientists. We need you. Please come and visit our site, visit our booth, talk to us about what we are doing, what you are doing, and bring everything to the next level. Thank you. Well, this, by the way, is, is something that we faced as an experience over the years. So as I said, we started in 2002, which is quite early for the industry, especially for our industry, using Python. And especially I, myself, I thought I could be, I was interested to be sort of a game changer, bring all the skills, all the knowledge, and do things differently than before. I've learned a lot. Um, so this is based on, on the experience that we faced over the years. If someone of you thinks you could be a game changer for a company as well, have a look at this. <laughs> it's not that simple. Um, you will face challenges and hopefully this helps a bit on that way forward. So thank you. Uh, for example, there is, so uh, we, I say we, we are sort of big data natives and we need to process the data as quickly as we can. If you want to get a first overview on the raw data that is coming from a tool which is unordered at that point, you want to create structure, you want to have native data types on your computing system and that means to have the cores glow in, in the system. That is not something which Python is good at today. Um, that is something where really our software engineers, our very clever guys, are writing C++ code, which allows them to process the data as quickly as, the, as they can. And we, we're seeing approaches there. So we had this excellent talk this morning by Matt Rockland about Dask. Dask is doing a terrific job in accelerating these things. There's also another alternative, I would say, to, to, C, to Cython, which is Numba, which allows you to have Python code just in time compiled in the back and have it leveled up to machine speed. That's also a good one. It's, not, it's in development. It's not perfect yet. It helps us from time to time to get at a point where we can really, in terms of speed, can compete to C++ code. But we have a really large code base, which is very, very well engineered. And we also we are, most of us, at least I, I am not a software engineer, so my approach to writing code is completely different to what they do. 
they are very much into uh, robust code, maintainable code over years. I'm thinking in get shit done, show how it works. And that is really what, what Python is, is, has strength. You can all do the robustness in Python as well, which is a good way for refinement um, to increase quality. So what you never should do, which is um, the do not reinvent the wheel thing, don't think and change or re-implement reference implementations that are existing in any other language. Try to use them, that sort of thing. So what is your level of being connected to the different Python communities or software projects and the level you contribute back to the projects? Is it some policy? So you keep your stuff close or do you contribute your stuff back? So we started as closed company, closed source, for sure. But this here in Karlsruhe is our starting point to contribute back. We think we have reached a level where we can contribute back. We don't have to hide. And we are interested in you, in your opinion about things we do. And we think we can help others with the things we do. So. From, from my side, it's, it's all based on intellectual properties. So a lot of our competitors are very, very interested in what we are really doing. And this is really not something that you want to open source, that we want to show everyone. So the magic behind that is a bit to distinguish between those things that are really, really of value for you as a company and those things which is more tooling. And as soon as you see that is tooling, my intellectual property, my value is based on how I use these tools. You can think of starting to proceed the way to get open source in that, in that area. This is something that we have started. You have to show management and top management that this would work and that there is a benefit. And you can start with very, very simple things like um, writing bug reports, um, making the tests for other people in a new environment, giving feedback, um, coming to uh, to code sprints or coming to conferences, get into a discussion. This is all open source work, and this is how we started as well. Very subtle, but hopefully straightforward. More questions? Okay, I have one about the last statement, um, embrace diversity, you need it. Yeah. Uh, I very much agree with it, of course, but um, as you may know, it uh, sometimes can be hard to argue for it. So maybe what are some arguments from your own standpoint that you can... Uh, Make about it. Um, embrace diversity. You need it. That could be um, that could be seen from very different levels. It could be regarding people. It could be regarding um, the skills you find in your company that could help you. It could be regarding hardware that you use. Um, for example, regarding hardware, that was a simple one, and um, we are a very Microsoft-focused company because our business demands that. All of our customers are running Windows systems. Um, so we need to provide these systems as well. But if you're into real serious high-performance computing, Windows is just not an option. So we start with Linux systems also very early. I believe in 2004, we had the first small 64-bit Linux cluster. It was the first 64-bit system that we ever used at Rosen. And yeah, it really it puts problems away. It wipes problems away. You can have larger data sets, you can speed up the prototyping. It, it will argue itself. So this is, that was the point where we got more open in, in using different tools as well. It's a star for diversity. And the same is true for the skills. If you have a lot of experienced software developers at hand like we do, then you want to have them in the boat. You want to help, let them help you, and you want to help them. There's also something not too focused on, let's try to replace something that is there, but let's extend it. And that's the same for, for the people as well. Right, there are no more questions. Thank uh, Jens and Pierre again for a great talk.